going to start off by introducing myself. I'm Aljamal Bainey, the chairperson of MORE, which is moving I'm all for race equity. It's been around for at least 10 years. In the last two years, we've focused much more on racial equity, anti-racism work, and probably one of the very few, if only, organization in Omaha that has anti-racism within its mission. Uh, today, joining with me is Nick Boulay, uh, Booyer, who is one of the board members uh, on, on MORE. And I got to give a little shout out to him because he's the one who initially approached our board and us about uh, asking uh, Walter Vincent Brooks to talk about his book. He actually saw it somewhere and had a preliminary understanding of what the book was about and said, hey, it fits our mission. So Nick is going to be my co-host tonight. And we're going to talk more about that issue related to genocide and the book, uh, which is titled Trust No Shadow After Dark, African-American Genocide in the United States of America. The format I want to say tonight is we, Nick and I are going to entertain a number of questions with Walter, probably the first 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to either raise questions via chat, sometimes we call an audible where we allow the guests or participants to talk directly to the author, so we may do that also. Uh, this is going to be, this has been recorded, so we have an opportunity that those who didn't get a chance to watch this can see it either on our Facebook uh, live, uh, it's a Facebook Live, it's in our Facebook page, or on web a page, which is more Omaha.org. Uh, the other format we want to like to share is that this is going to be somewhat a contentious issue for some. I consider it very logical. I was telling Walter at one point when we were talking that his book jumped into my top 10 list of books after reading it. I was very much uh, surprised with some of the content material, uh, a lot of it I didn't know about, and I think he brings a lot of footnote material within his book, and he raises some important issues that are affecting us today. We only need to look at what happened in South Carolina a few years ago, and recently we see what happened in Buffalo, New York. All these things are related to what Walter talks about in his book. We also ask the participants if you can turn on your cameras, unless you're working for the CIA or something like that, but we want to get as much input and feedback and be able to see people who are participating. We want you to also keep your questions brief. Walter did indicate that he's open for people contacting him after the program. So if you have a, a little bit more information you want to share or questions, he will make his email available in the chat for folks to email him if they have some other concerns or issues that they like to raise. Walter has been living in Omaha for a number of years, and again, Nick is going to introduce him, but I want to say two other things related to this. One of the things that we face in these trying times, there are very few agencies who allow people and organizations to have honest uh, conversation and dialogue about issues related to race, race equity, and so on, and this is where more comes in. We hope that this is an opportunity where, again, we're here to learn from each other, but more than anything, to have an author such as Walter talk about his book. We're going to focus on his book, and again, I will try to be the tech master in terms of time to keep us on focus there but we're extremely happy to have uh, Walter join us tonight and I'm going to pass it over to Nick to let him do the introductions and then we will do our switch up and tag team for a while and then make sure we open it up exactly at a uh, it's time appropriate so Nick uh, can you go take it from there yes I can uh, thank you uh, Ajmal for the introduction uh, my name is Nick Bollier. I've been on the board of MORE for two years now, and uh, I'm also a filmmaker who's been making a film that's chronicled uh, racial justice in Omaha for a number of years, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Walter uh, and, and to introduce him. So uh, Walter Vincent Brooks is a journalist, uh, social research investigator, and community activist with over 50 years of service in the 400 years war against white supremacy and racism in the United States of America. He grew up in the Seattle area, spent time in Colorado and lived in Omaha for 35 years. He was a longtime contributor to the Omaha Star uh, and served on the board for the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation. And he is currently joining us from North Carolina. So uh, Walter, it is my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you so much for being on here with us. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Ajamal. You know, I my book was just published uh, in October of last year, and uh, for a lot of reasons, I'm just now getting into this part as an author and 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 coming out into the public. So this is really my first real public, what you know, in the business book event, and it means a lot to me that you guys cared enough about what I wrote to uh, see some connective tissue to the Moore mission, uh, as well as uh, an opportunity for me to uh, re-embrace Omaha. I was there for 35 years and I've only been gone for three years. 
And uh, Omaha is seminal to me in terms of my writing career, my professional communications career. Um, honestly, uh, the sum total of my life as a writer and a journalist and all of that, uh, Omaha speaks for the lion's share of that, absolutely. And so I'm really thrilled that my, my, my first time out, you know, so to speak, is with uh, Omaha folks and particularly your organization. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, we're we're very happy to be that first destination for you, and uh, and a big thank you to everyone that's that's dialed in, and we look forward to your questions. Um, before I ask my first question, I thought it would be great if you could read us um, a, a quick passage from your book. Um, if you go to page one eighty three, and if people want to read along, that's where we're going to start. Um, I think you've got just a, a great uh, kind of two paragraphs there that really introduces who you are which will lead into my question of kind of how you got started writing this book. So if you want to read that and then I'll ask my question, uh, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's traditional that most people, when they uh, write a book, if they're going to make a personal comment, it's in the preface or possibly the introduction. I, on the other hand, really wanted to get into my message and I did not address myself personally until the final chapter uh, and because I felt that my final chapter is really, really getting into the meat and the heart of my message, I thought, I think pe I want people to get a little bit of understanding about who I am personally now at this point before I, I close out my book. And uh, the two uh, paragraphs that Nick has asked me to read are actually the final two paragraphs of what is a three-page kind of short bio of who I am and how I came to be and why I wrote this book. So here we go. I have put a lot of years into this project, but I'm ready now. I stand here before you assured that I have at least one thing in common with all of you. I am the sum total of the life I've lived and so are you. There is no singular Black experience in the United States. The Black experience starts the second you're born with Black blood in your veins. You spend the rest of your existence just trying to sort all of that out. All I know is that ever since I returned home from Vietnam, I have never stopped feeling a responsibility for Black people in America. That is the greatest blessing I received from my brothers in Vietnam. They saw beyond my whiteness and gave me love, strength, purpose, and the will to find my way home. I never wanted to let them down. In memory of my Black brothers in Vietnam, who lifted me up and started me on my way. In memory of the many incredibly decent white human beings I have encountered in my lifetime, people who I know did not make this racist reality called America, but nevertheless, we'll now have to answer for it. And above all, in memory of centuries of African Americans who held it down, who fought and died in the 400 years war against white supremacy in the United States of America, and who knew with complete spiritual certainty that someday a Walter Vincent Brooks would be coming behind them. I now take my place. Why is this my time to speak? The answer to that question is not complicated at all. To respectfully borrow a simple yet ocean deep lyric by hip-hop music star Drake, 
I started from the bottom and now I'm here. That thanks, means, Walter. go ahead, Nick. Yeah, th thanks Walter for reading that. I, I mean, I think it's very powerful that you have this personal anecdote of where you do and kind of let the reader in behind who the person is. Um, so it's, it's my understanding that you began the jumping off point of researching and writing this book in 1975, I believe, right? 1975, um, that, was, that was the year I discovered the book by Dr. Raul Hilberg, The Destruction of the European Jews. That started, so here I am 46 years later, but that was the seed because I visited a friend in Chicago. She was attending Roosevelt University, taking some night courses. I went to one of her classes by sheer fate. The handout that the professor gave the class that night that I was there, the only night I was there, was a photocopy of a page taken from the destruction of the European Jews. And it was, it was spellbinding that somebody had written a book, not, not spellbinding that somebody had written a book about the Holocaust, but the fact that it was the first time I had ever read anything relating to the Holocaust that was made, that associated the Holocaust with the potential for something like that happening to African-Americans in the United States of America. And I was like, what is this all about? I, I was living in Denver. I went back to Denver. I went to the Denver Public Library. I checked out a copy of that book. It was a single volume, 900 pages. And it was spellbinding. It was spellbinding. And I have read as much as I could read, uh, written by Dr. Raul Hilberg, uh, ever since. And I wanted to know more about how he made that association when he published in 1961. It Walter, was yes. Walter, I was going to ask you a different question, but it's related to that. In, in your book, you outlined these salient points about the Jewish Holocaust, how it was promulgated. And one of the things I pulled from the book is that oftentimes the Jewish people fail to push back or offer resistance in the early stages. And you draw some great parallels to what African Americans are experiencing today, particularly those who are apologists for some of the behaviors and things that have happened to us historically in this country. And you often in the book allude to a, a raw Hindenburg, a Hindenburg uh, comments of collaborators. And in the book that he wrote also talks about bystanders. My question is, are we blaming the victim in the way that we lay that out? Again, sometimes people get codified into behaving a certain way, but how do you avoid that process? So it's a general question. There. I look at this as at the end of chapter one, which is my chapter where I deconstruct the, the my takeaways from the destruction of the European Jews. Uh, on, the, on the last page of chapter one, I raised the comment, how, how was it possible that the European Jewish people, the Jewish people known worldwide for their cohesiveness, their religious devotion, their economic independence and, and self-sustaining, how is it that one of the world's recognized smartest all around most wonderful people found themselves literally trapped in Nazi-occupied Europe and, and virtually at the will of mass murderers. And Dr. Hilberg's book was very important to me because he, he talked a lot about the essentially the failure of, of, of Jewish leadership to really recognize this was not just another generational um, uh, level of extreme anti-Semitism. The Jewish people for centuries, for thousands of years, had fought against discrimination, but nobody, nobody really um, understood this is, this is not business anti-Semitism as usual. This is a vortex of technology, 
of governmental authority and administration that was going to seriously attempt to wipe them off the face of the earth. That is a failure of leadership. That is a failure of leadership that is uh, a failure to look beyond the most immediate. And so my first chapter is really focusing on his takeaway. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying Jewish leadership failed them. Right. I'm I got you. Saying, I that's yeah. what Dr. Hilberg documented. His yeah. first volume was 900 pages. Right. And then in 1961, and then in 1985, he he came out with a three volume, 1,200 page magnum opus. The man found 300 more pages to add. It's there. So I'm not saying the Jewish leadership failed the Jewish people. I'm saying he laid it out as to how they. Gotcha. Did. Good. And I'm extrapolating from that, that a lot of the African-American leadership, I feel, is still operating on principles that came of age in the 50s and 60s. It's like we're right. not really altering our thinking to really look at what is happening. Walter, I'll jump in with a question here. Um, you know, a lot of your chapters are specific to uh, specific uh, you know, real macro issues related to white supremacy and racism. And uh, specifically, some of these are, are, were not really commonly identified until much later than 1975. Like, for example, the prison industrial complex was not really a, an issue that we understood until much after that. So talk to us about how, as you're researching, writing, reading in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, how uh, things changed from when you started to then witnessing all these things transpiring over the decades? Well, I think that's one of the reasons it, it, it took me, you know, from seed gestation to, to complete publication, it took over 40 years because I'm, I'm researching, but I'm learning as, as I'm researching. It's like I had an idea and it's like, could this possibly be leading the African-American people down this road. So I needed to look at it from all the aspects of our living conditions, uh, imprisonment, our economics. Why in all of the indexes that we value for um, life, sustained good living, we're, we're suffering such a misery index in, in virtually every category of existence in America. And we've had for centuries, even though since the civil rights movement, the belief was like, we're making some very serious headway. And, and, and I'm progressively seeing from one decade to the next, how things that we thought 20 years ago were valuable and working, they turned out to be ashes in our mouth. Hey, Walter, one quick question that jumps out. How do you define genocide? I mean, you alluded to it very often in the book, and you also contrast it with the Jewish Holocaust. So as you just alluded to, African-Americans being asleep at the wheel or not seeing some of these anomalies, how do you define genocide in the context of African-American experience in the United States? Well, in my book, I, I start with the United Nations Convention on Genocide, those key points. Okay, and let me uh, let me look those up real quick and just read this. These these points it says in the ratified in 1948. All right, genocide is a killing members of the group. B causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. I document, I captured the data to say all five of these are in play and have been in play amongst the African-American population in the United States, certainly since 1975. 
And if people say, well, in, uh, preventing births, uh, I have a point in my book where, where I document that um, over 15 million babies have been abort aborted. All these issues wow. about abortion, it, it's predominantly Black people who are aborting. Wow. My okay. God. Um, I have a section where I take on the child welfare system in America. Today, you go into any major urban center in the United States of America, go into what they call family court. That's where the judges are making decisions. Children have been taken from their parents for one reason or another. You go in those courts across the country, coast to coast, 95% of all the people in those courts are Black people. They are taking Black children away from Black parents in America today at a rate that hasn't been seen since slavery, where children were just bought and sold with regularity. It's happening. All five of these are in play. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Walter, I have a question of kind of advancing the timeline a little bit. I'm, I'm going to read a quick excerpt from page 214, um, it reads, Blacks are never going to outgun the white race in the United States. The goal is not to start this fight. Rather, the goal is to convince those who think it is time to exterminate the black race in America that they really don't want to go there. It will be their doom. So it's time for racists to finally join the future and let America work for everybody, not just white people. And the reason I wanted to read that is it, it feels sort of like a, a thesis in a way. And I'm curious when you say, you know, the goal is to convince, how do you think that effort is going today? So, you know, when you, you know, you look at 2020 and uh, what happened with, with protests and some of the change that occurred, do you see hopeful signs when it comes to that convincing or do you, do you, are you more pessimistic about where we're at as far as that convincing effort goes? Well, put it in those terms, uh, Nick, I'd say I'm probably more pessimistic. Uh, the outcry against uh, law enforcement violence against African Americans in this country went worldwide with the death of uh, the hideous death of uh, George Floyd. But uh, of, of late, probably within the last six months, I've read numerous material that are saying all of that is on the wane. Like, yeah, there was you know a lot to do. But it's like, okay, we've kind of moved on from that. Um, and more than anything, it's about all of the elements. So my book takes it from the education standpoint, the, the criminal justice standpoint, the housing and urban living standpoint, uh, the self-violence within the Black community. We're, no doubt about it, we are killing ourselves at fairly epic rates. Um, and and all of these elements, the breakdown of our family, these things are not really being addressed. Now, I'm not saying there are not people out here fighting all against these elements. For one thing, we're very much siloed. People who are fighting for better education for Black people, they may not be all that concerned about what's happening economically and so forth. And we need a, a greater combined effort but until we reach that, I don't think we're convincing white supremacists in the 75 million people almost that voted for Donald, <clears throat> excuse me, for Donald Trump. Walter, we have about five, six minutes with me and Nick and engage you. Then we yeah. got to throw it out to the audience. So as sure. a timekeeper, the official that I want to be, That's all right. That's uh, all right. I have allegiance <clears throat> to that. But I do have at least one more question that probably Nick sure. has one. Uh, considering the nature of black studies and Jewish studies at UNO or elsewhere, what do you know about Omaha respective academic departments uh, in terms of dealing with some of these concepts or issues? And would any academicians in our ivory towers use this book as a textbook for advocacy efforts to reverse the negative conditions that you outline in the book? And again, you know a little bit about Omaha being here many years, but do you see the academicians locally taking your book and using it as a textbook? Well, so far, um, the only one that has ever given me access uh, academic access to his classroom is uh, Professor Dennis Hoffman at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I spoke to uh, four of his criminal justice classes and I felt and he felt the response was quite good and this was pre-publication. This was pre-publication and um, uh, 
I, I feel the book has legs academically, but somebody's got to take a chance. If, if, if you let me get before the kids, I think I can make the connection where they will feel this is something that is value to enhance their Black studies, enhance their Jewish studies, and so forth. But in, in a sense, it's not my call to make. Yeah. You know, somebody's got to get a copy of the book, you know, talk to me. And, and I, I, I think there's a bridge there. Yeah. But that's a bridge they've got to they've got to make to me. I'm ready. I'm here. Yeah. Nick. Yeah, Walter. My my last question before we turn to the audience is just, uh, you know, what what would be your message to to white people who subscribe to the framework that you lay out, um, and and how do you think that they can help the cause uh, in, uh, in your words? I'm sorry. Uh, give me that again, please. What would be your message to to white people who subscribe to the framework that you lay out? And, and, you know, in your words, how can they help the cause? Well, you know, that's been the, the perennial question for, you know, generations. And it's simply one, they really, whites really have to avail themselves of a greater attempt to really learn what has happened in this country. That's what all of this critical race theory and all that, forget these titles. The public education system, which accounts for the, the bulk of education in America, um, is simply not going deep enough to address what has happened. So a lot of whites, I think, can't get their mind wrapped around why things are so bad for Blacks and so forth, because they really don't know what has happened. It hasn't been within their purview, their lifetime purview, to, to need to know these things. This system is about teaching Blacks and Latinos and everybody else about white history and white life. We're, we're still trying to get parity in, can you just tell the whole story? The truth <laughs> and nothing but the truth. You can call it critical race theory, call it whatever you want. I just say, can we be taught, especially our children, the whole story of America. It's not pretty. The truth often isn't pretty. But nevertheless, as Dr. Martin Luther King said over and over, it is the truth that sets you free. And now I'm not talking just by Black people being set free, but white people themselves. They, they're trapped in a lot of philosophy and thinking that is progressively completely out of sync, not just with minorities in America, but with the, the human race. Good. We're, we're right up on that time. We got a minute or so, but I wanted to make a couple of, of editorial comments. Like one of the things that this book does is it uh, actually challenges us to think different paradigms. And also, Walter, I have to give you credit of coming from a different point of view of pessimistic in terms of what's happening today because we do have problems with the talent and chance to sell out so the elites are looking another way and so the parody or at least the comparison analysis of what happened to the Jewish folks in the Holocaust it gives a, a great pause for us to look at history and treat it very seriously but before we get there I want to, one of the things I want to throw out to the audience and I think it's part of this conversation is we're not going to be able to grow or improve ourselves without asking some tough questions. And so sure. I think when Walter alluded to critical race theory and the fact that we have closure culture where people don't want to hear stuff. Uh, and again, Walter, one of the things you said, I hope the young people, I see adults hearing this story because, again, our children learn from us as adults. And I hear young people uh, complain that some things have not been done well. But again, they can't do no more than what has been taught to them. And we all agree that as our ancestors and those who are elders who have got us this far. And so, again, we don't want to dismiss someone's because of their age because I don't have a lot of hope that some young person who's got that microwave education is going to get it the same way some of us who went to microwave education I like that I'm going to steal that term I love microwave it. education and, and again everybody gets an A in class and I see some of these ignoramuses walking around who think they can teach history but they've never lived it in a sense or those who've never set foot in our respective communities becoming experts on our own culture so I'm going to stop there and we're going to throw this out to the participants and one of the things I like to do is we got some chats here but we also would like to have people directly open up their mic at some point and say things directly to Walter so uh, maybe we want to start off with the first question or thing that came out and then kind of open it up to people to maybe respond to their own question so they can talk directly to Walter and as we say, feel the love. <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet. So for those who want to speak a question, if you want to maybe raise your hand on Zoom and then we can find you and then uh, call on you, that might be the best way to go about this. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. As a matter of fact, I told him that the majority of people who join us would have read the book. So there's some critical theorists out there. Okay, I see. I see Paul. I see Paul first. Paul, okay, uh, Paul. go ahead. Yeah, Walter, um, could you... I, I came across a book today that talks about the destruction of black civilization as a whole um, the one. In, yeah, in Africa. And um, mm -hmm. that was, he came out, there's a YouTube video, but he went over and did research all over Africa in the seventies. Yes, and can you talk a little bit about that? I was fascinated by his description of that. And I, I just got started on it, but I just thought it kind of fits in with where you're coming from. Uh, absolutely, and I'm glad you make the association. Um, of course, I mentioned Dr. Hilberg in terms of his assessment of the Holocaust was instrumental in leading to my book. But from an African-American standpoint, I would probably give an equal seat to Dr. Chancellor Williams, who wrote a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization, Great Issues of the Race from 5,000 BC to 2000 AD. That is an arc of 7,000 years. And Dr. Williams, his motivation, in a sense, I think my motivation was fairly like his. His motivation was very simple. In his introduction, he talks about the greatness of Africa, you know, the pyramids. And, and we were at one point truly certainly one of the great leading peoples of this planet and possibly at the, head of, at the head of the class. And he wanted to know, how did we go from that elevation of global stature to what he, in his own words, and I will put into my words, we became the black race for the, certainly the last 500 years of Western civilization. We've been more or less the rectum of the human race from slavery and then centuries of, of post-slavery uh, racism, apartheid, discrimination, and so forth. I wanted to know how that has played out in America. We know we started from the bottom in America, so it's not so much how did we come from the top of America to the bottom, but more like how did Africa go from the top of the world to where people need to understand something, uh, Paul, and that is Africa had been fighting enslavement by the Arab Muslim nations coming to Africa for 700 years before the first whites even showed up. So the white race, by the time it came to Africa, we were already more or less on the ropes to use that, that kind of analogy. We've been battling forever. So we, got, we, we didn't have what we, we, we needed to stop the confiscation of masses, millions and millions of African people into slavery and the deaths that accounted uh, for, you know, it, the, the historians have said, and I'll just stop on this, Paul. Historians have said for every African that successfully was brought across the Atlantic Ocean as a slave, there were at least 10 who died. And we know that 12 and a half million came across that ocean to the Western hemisphere, which means the, the enslavement of black people in Africa to the Western world at the hands of the white race may have cost between 100 and 120 million African lives. Well, if you got three hands up here, I want to see if we can go in the sequence okay. of raise your hand. So yeah, there are a couple okay. people who ask questions for you. So yes, next, I think, is it? Uh, yeah. Katie, who's next? If you can unmute uh, your mic. Uh, and then, I see, uh, Ke is it Keetran? Keetran, yeah. Next. And th thank you, Paul, for your question. Yes. Hi, Walter, well, good to see you. Hi, Keetran. Um, Woman and as a feminist, I always get very nervous to start talking about abortion. Yes. Um, 
I, I just like to remind people that black women are having abortions because they choose them. You know, it's not that anyone is forcing black women to have abortions. And so while you were talking, I just Googled, you know, the percentages of, you know, different races that have abortions. And they reiterate that Every abortion happens because of an unintended, unwanted pregnancy. And the way to solve the high rate of abortions among Black women is to have better contraception, cheaper contraception, to help Black women to prevent pregnancy in the first place. You know, so, but, you know, abortion is a choice that Black women choose. And I have to stand in solidarity with them that they have the right to say, I have to terminate this pregnancy either because I have too many children or I'm too poor or I don't love this guy or whatever, but yeah. it's the right to, to terminate a pregnancy. Okay. And Kitchen, I, I agree with that. I'm not going to argue with that aspect of it, but again, by your own words, you're really focused, you're really outlining there's just a lot of very tough, horrific social conditions that African Americans face that lead to this. So yes, it's a choice. But if, if the economics were better, the job opportunities, the education yeah. and all that, then maybe 15 million babies wouldn't have been a choice, but would have, would have come through. And uh, interestingly enough, that comment, and I discussed that in my book, was brought out by a Black woman who was the first Black woman to be the um, uh, director, national director of Right to Life. And she was the one who was vilified and scorned by the national Black leadership. How dare you say that Black women should not abort? But in, in her defense, she, she made what I think is a very credible argument, and I put it in my book. She says, yeah, but you got to understand something. This has taken 15 million 15 million babies now but, but I gotta say, you know, but it's, not babies. it's it's not always baby's fault or it's just a woman wants to get her period she wants to menstruate she doesn't want to be pregnant it's a choice do you want your period no. do you want to menstruate so in the first trimester of abortion we're not talking about babies we're talking about a woman who just wants her period and okay. this is something that i've been discussing with women in, yeah. the, in the movement you know which is that you know, we should stop talking about this as babies. This is just menstruation. I want to menstruate. I have a right to menstruate. And no one should be telling me that I have to be pregnant when what I want is my period. <laughs> you know, you. Kitra, you. We'll, you. we can take this up more via yeah. email. I'd like to have us move uh, on to another point. Okay. No, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I we can spend all day on this abortion issue, but I, yeah. again, we're trying to focus, even though it's part of the book. Uh, is who's next? Is it Autumn or Cynthia next? Who I, it's, I think I saw Cynthia's hand first. So okay, we'll Cynthia. Can I say one thing? I want anybody that's going to respond <laughs> tonight to know I am more than willing to continue the conversation via email. Well, I know we're going to get into some contentions and things like that. I, you know, I'm not making a judgment call. I'm just saying. I'd love to talk to Kitchen some more. I'd love to talk to Paul some more about the destruction of Black civilization. I'm willing to do that. Okay. Cynthia. Yeah, Walter, great to see you. And uh, this is definitely not a microwave book. I'd say it's more like a 10-course meal type of book. Uh, anyone that has <laughs> over 450 endnotes, and I'm one of those people that reads every endnote. Good, had, good. I, one of the things when you wrote about constitutional carry and the point you were making, when you said 16 states, I'm like, nah, I can't be 16. And I looked it up and now it's actually up to almost 25. Just yeah, to, yeah, it's a more article. More. I mean, yeah. and that's scary. But what I really want to ask you, based on your military experience and the book itself, uh, just your take on a great man who just passed away, Colin Powell. And how he fits into uh, American history as an African-American who it, it, many could argue was used by the military industrial complex because of his race. I was just wondering your own take on, on Colin Powell. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not trying to short circuit your question, but if you go to my book website, um, HTTPS slash slash trust dash no dash shadows dash after dash dark dot com. 
I actually have posted up uh, in his memory when he passed recently, my thoughts about uh, Colin Powell. Uh, in short, uh, he was great, certainly in terms of his military history and everything else, but I had some serious issues. Uh, first of all, I am a United States Marine Corps Vietnam vet. Uh, when the My Lai massacre was brought to the attention of the military command in Vietnam, it first came by way of a letter of one of the participants who actively was there killing Vietnamese women and children in the My Lai massacre. His letter actually was relating to, you shouldn't have asked us to do that. We didn't join the military to massacre women and children, okay? His letter was given to the command and Colin Powell on what would have been his second tour. He made three tours to Vietnam. On his second tour, he was a major and he was assigned to the unit that uh, did uh, perpetrated the My Lai massacre and he was in charge of the investigation. His report said no massacre had taken place at all. He, com he completely denied it. He said, my investigation indicates this was a complete fabrication, plus American soldiers would never do something this heinous uh, and so forth. And he actually ended his report by saying, my conversation with the troops is that the, the relations between American soldiers and the Vietnamese are actually pretty good. Okay, now, the next letter wasn't given to the command. It was written to one of the perpetrator's mother. He wrote his mother saying, we did this horrible thing and we slaughtered all of these innocent people. She gave the letter to her congressperson. That person gave it to the New York Times. Wow. And the, the journalist at the New York Times who was assigned to investigate this possible massacre was Mr. Seymour Hirsch who went on to write the story and received the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Exposing the Truth Behind the My Lai Massacre. Uh, so Colin Powell, from his early stages, had a huge splash of egg on his face. Right? Wow. Um, wow. Now, other than that, but, but that's the kind of thing that made his career. You know, that's what happens. You got to look the other way, you know, and things like that. And in my essay uh, memorializing him. what I'm trying to do in his defense I want to remind people when African Americans and people of color rise to the top the CEO of this giant fortune 500 corporation or become a general you know two three four star generals there's a price to be paid for that that right. I don't think people understand. You don't make it up in that. If Colin Powell had came and wrote the My Lai massacre happened and we need to do something, he probably would have never got past major because we, we, he told the powers to be a lie. We, okay. got, we got two more questions jumping out at us. Is it Adam, you next and then Autumn, I think? Yes, go ahead. I think Autumn was first. Oh, go ahead. I'm going. Ahead. Sorry about that. So I have a question. Um, I know that you talked about how your book took you over 40 years to write. And in that time, I know you have seen lots of things um, in your youth and even as you grow older. And with the way the world is, it's starting to repeat itself. Now, I know we've had influential leaders such as MLK, Rosa Parks, Emmett Till, Malcolm X, people of that nature. Um, do you think that history will repeat in terms of those people who have made a great impact for Black people in our lives so that, you know, some of the racism and things that happen now will not per se phase out, but get better for the Black race? Well, Autumn, I... I don't think we're going to reproduce people of that caliber. The, the, you know, and you're, you're naming people that really are some of the, the, the icons of the civil rights movement. And we have to remember that the civil rights movement, first of all, was predominantly a nonviolent movement. 
that opened the door for a lot of people to come in and despite the violence used against black people here, there, everywhere, nevertheless, we produce day after day, month in, month out, year in, year out, we produce a, a caliber, a, a, a panorama of black leadership that I don't really think we're gonna be able to reproduce again. That does not mean we're not gonna reproduce leadership. But I think that in, in, as much as we uplift Rosa Parks and, and all these people, what I also want people to do is go back and look at everything they said and did. Because what we're having to deal with now, like every year we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, right? And I almost don't go to those things too much more because I keep sitting there observing this and going, when are you going to tell us about the rest of Dr. King? When are you going to tell us about how he felt the last five years, you yeah. know, of his life? He was changing his outlook on America in a very, very big way. He had took on the Vietnam War when everybody told him, no, stay out of that. You just deal with civil rights. You leave, you leave the government wars and all that alone. He was changing his attitude about the American economic system. He said, in fact, I don't think under this current free enterprise capitalist system, black people are ever gonna find true justice because money comes into play so much. Malcolm X changed a lot of his thinking the last couple of years of his life. We, people remember him as, oh, that's the guy that hated white people. Well, he never did that like that. But he changed a lot of his discussion and conversation about white folks because he realized that we really are all, all in this together in, in a very real way. So I, I believe we're going to generate new leadership, new generations of leadership, but it's a lot tougher now because we got the right to vote now when we didn't used to have. There's a lot of things that we did get done. The past generations got done, but now we're like, but that didn't solve a lot of the real problems we have. So now we need leadership that is going to go after what we're really facing, not stuff that we were facing 50 years ago. Adam, you there now, Adam? I am. Thank you, Ajman. And Walter, thank you for your book. I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, I appreciate especially the thesis, um, you know, as someone who's a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize or don't reflect so much about the fact that the Holocaust is not unique in history and that the events that arise for genocide, it's a, it's a, it's a progression of processes. And the, as you said, technology, authoritarian systems, all culminate to make uh, genocide uh, something that occurs. Yeah. And uh, so th this was something I was completely sold on in the book and I appreciate your writing and, and, and the historical knowledge that you bring. One part of the book that I wasn't completely clear on is maybe some of the economic topics that okay. are touched on. And that would be, there are three different instances and I think in the context, I understand what you were saying, but at different times you kind of refer to the black community as past slavery, uh, the black community would be perceived as economically insignificant. But then there are references where it says, well, corporations really want our money and we are losing our ability to invest in rebuilding Black Wall Street. And so I felt like there was uh, something I would love to hear from you as far as clarity about how the black community rebuilds its economic base in the United States and particularly um, uh, what kinds of uh, what kinds of changes people in this Zoom meeting could be discussing in, in Omaha, Nebraska to, to get there? We, you know, anti-Semitism hasn't been wiped away from the face of the earth, but the material conditions for Jewish Americans have improved dramatically from what my grandparents experienced. So what would you see on that issue and how would you work through some of the, uh, some of the statements on economic topics that, at, at least from my reading of it, at times it seemed to contradict uh, th there is a citation in my book um, by an African-American professor who has really spent a lot of his career looking at just what you're talking about. And he said, people have to understand this. An economic system is not founded on money, the exchange of money. He said an economic system at its heart is the relationships between people. 
I talk about how Chinese people in America do not have to promote uh, Chinese inter-Chinese cooperation economically. As I, as I say, Chinese people don't have to beg other Chinese people to do business with Chinese. Jewish people don't have to beg other Jewish people to do, to do business with other Jewish people and so forth. The African-American people, we are still struggling with, with, with advancing the belief system that our economy, our ability to grow as a people economically is really rooted in our ability to do business with each other. That's what all the other ethnic groups of America either came to America, immigrated to America, and, and brought that with them, okay? And why did they come to America and have that sense of, of ethnic economic unity? Because they were, did not come to America as slaves and have all of those cultural strengths stripped out of them within, within a couple of generations. We are in the process of trying to regain that trust. You made the mention that I made a point where, uh, well, they weren't concerned with money. Now this relates to at the turn of the century, prior to the turn of the century, when black people were still 90 plus percent of us were sharecroppers. We were agrarian serfs, agrarian peons until the great migration began at the turn of the century and almost uh, 7 million black people moved into cities, okay? Now, once we were in the cities, we now had the critical mass of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who could do business with one another. And they were out of that Southern peonage sharecropping system. We made headway at lightning speed, at lightning speed. That's where we got the great Tulsa, Oklahoma City. Only 12,000 people, but to really read every business in that, that community was black owned. We are still trying to get back to 1921 and Tulsa, Oklahoma, when our communities are literally owned by black people. We're still trying to get that back. And it's a tough thing to do because we have had so many generations of people who don't really had never experienced that to understand that's what we've got to do. We'll get a lot more respect when we stop seeking handouts. We have a, a, a trillion dollar plus annual, now it's probably about 1.5, 1.6 trillion dollars that comes into the black community's hands and we are only keeping 5% of that right now at most in our hands. The rest of it goes out into other people's economies. We're never gonna not be broke as long as that's happening. So there's a lot, to, a lot of work that has to be done, but it always comes back to the relationships that people have between each other. That was stripped away from us through 250 years of slavery and you don't get it back overnight. We got a couple of questions. Lindsay, you're next, and then Peyton, 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 Peyton. I think it's Peyton first. Okay, go ahead, Peyton. Sorry about that. Well, definitely. Uh, hey, I appreciate, I pre hey, 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 I appreciate. Got a feedback there. It's hard to hear you. <laughs> I, I think we might have. We might have awesome. lost Peyton, uh, so maybe when we Lindsay, wait for him to come back, we'll, we'll go to Lindsay. Yeah, um, sorry, this question probably isn't going to be worded super well, but I kind of wanted to go back to Autumn's question, and your response also just got me thinking a lot about, um, like, what does actual progress looks, look like for positive change um, for African Americans when there are so many intersections of um just strategic destruction when it comes to economics and education and neighborhoods. And I mean, like, there's, there's just so much going on and um, like you tackle the education system, but that doesn't necessarily like solve the problem, right? It's just another band-aid um, because there's so much else happening. And so when it, when it comes to actual progress in, in your mind, Walter, what is progress start to look like 
because all I can think of is we got to just like tear the system down and start all over again. But I mean, how, how does that even happen? Well, that's the three billion dollar question. Progress, the problem with progress is that we have been convinced that progress for African Americans is, well, white folks ain't hanging us from trees. There hasn't been a tree hanging lynching in, in decades and decades and decades. Uh, we can go pretty much wherever we want. You know, there's no white only, black only. So, so the civil rights movement advanced us past that. But as we have seen, you know, 40, 50 years down the road, we really haven't achieved real elements of power. Now, people will look at me and say, what, what Obama was president. Yeah, and, and, and look at us. How much was done for black people? I, I'm not saying Obama didn't do some good things for the country, but he was very, very, when, with the study, my, my detailed study of Obama was, he avoided pretty much anything where he was going to be saying, I'm going to get this done for the African-American people. And, and, and me and I think millions of us thought maybe we'll finally get a chance because he's the president now. He can make a judgment call. You know, I compare Obama to Trump in the sense that Donald Trump said every tool in the, in the toolbox, every weapon, in the, in the box that I can use as my authority of, as president of the United States, I'm using. And Obama didn't do that. It's kind of like, you know, we thought, okay, well, let's get him in office. And now we know he can't really kind of do a lot of stuff in that first term because then he won't get reelected. But then, you know, in America, the general feeling is once you're in that second term, you got nothing to lose. Go for it. Let's, let's get some stuff done. But no, he felt his responsibility was to keep the seat warm for the Democratic Party, not really get things done. So the, the question of what does progress look like? Progress is people fighting injustice. That's progress. Not so much like we've achieved this, this glorious state of what Dr. King said, you know, I dream one day we're just all going to be together and everything's going to be cool, which, by the way, I did not put in my book, but Dr. King did repudiate, uh, in my estimation, his I Have a Dream speech uh, about three years, about five years later, well, about four years later, where he said, as a, he was asked about it, do you still feel that way, Dr. King? And one day we're, he says, well, I think I was speaking from a naivete about the depth of racism and white supremacy in this country. It's not going to go away that easy. Now, I do have a quote in my book um, by the architect, the psycho psych psychological architect on the uh, desegregation of public schools in 1954. Dr. Kenneth B. Clark gave a presentation to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, where he did the, what they call the doll experiment, where you put black dolls and white dolls in front of black children and ask them various questions. Who's the smartest? Well, the black kids will pick the white doll. Who's the prettiest? Well, the black children pick the white doll and all these things. And he brought all of this data to the Supreme Court saying, this is clearly establishing that segregation is warping our children to the point that they don't see themselves as having any natural beauty, any natural brains, and so forth. And it was a, considered one of the most important powerhouse moments that led to that decision. 40 years later, the quote is in my book, he repudiated that saying, uh, Dr. Kenneth B. Clark says, I can't, be, I look back and I can't believe how naive all of us were to believe that this was going to change the, dramatically change the educational outcome for black children. He said, we simply couldn't understand the depth of racism and what it was gonna take to eliminate it in this country. And he said, uh, it, he ends the quote by saying, I've had to come to, to, to grips with the fact 
that the last 40 years of my life have been essentially one glorious defeat after another. So I'm not seeing, I wouldn't have wrote my book if I really felt I was seeing like we're turning the corner. This, we're, 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 we're getting close to it, you know? I would love for my book to, to have never been required to be written. So I could have, you know, wrote my little dime novel or whatever. But that's what, that's what we're facing. And we have to look at this situation and ask ourselves a whole new set of questions. We're still asking questions like it's 19, the 1950s and the 1960s. We're still kind of pushing the same kind of programming and this is a whole different ball game we're facing. And that's why it's so tough. That's why it's so tough for Black people to figure out, well, what do we do next? What do we do next? And, and we're seeing major deterioration, not only in our communities, but now throughout all of America. There's a well, lot of suffering white folks out right. there now. Well, really. Walter, I would, I would respond a little bit by saying that at the end of the day, you compare the economic situations of African Americans that are home ownership, income, job, unemployment. Yeah. And I've worked in public uh, government and private nonprofits, and yeah. there are very few African Americans in some key positions. And even yeah. in our communities, agencies that traditionally were headed by African Americans are now headed by folks who don't live in the community, got yeah. teachers predominantly were white females, and there are very few African American males in school. So yeah. you can look at that. But I had a different question. I, I wanted to kind of come to a different question. I know we got some other folks who may have questions, but I wanted to ask a question. I've been following, and I know there's a couple of folks on the on, on the Zoom here on this event who maybe can speak to it also. I was looking at the national ADL and I'm surprised how they use the word racism. Even locally, they talk about racism. And I don't see many African Americans or people of color. And some people raise the question is that the black Jewish relationship is non-existent today, looking at the LD, ADL and other Jewish advocacy groups. Uh, from your book, you allude to that a bit, that that relationship is really not out there. And so can you speak to why it's not there or what can be done if that isn't one of the goals to bring the groups who've experienced this kind of situation together? Well, Ajamal, one, one of the little short quotes I like to give, it's not in my book, but to start this response, uh, the late leader, African leader, Patrice Lumumba uh, famously said in politics, there is no such thing as platonic love. And what he meant by that is everybody is coming to the table with their own interests. The problem with coalition building and working, particularly now, as opposed to the original civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, is that everybody's interests, I, I think with the exception of ours, we are still facing the same issues, you know, 60 years down the road. But a lot of other people, and particularly the Jewish community, they have different issues as uh, the, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. I see your face. We, we said, well, you know, for a lot of Jewish people now, it's like anti-Semitism is not that big a factor. Now, it, 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 does, it hasn't gone away, but, but Jewish people, by and, Jewish Americans, I'm saying Jewish Americans, by and large, do not have to exist under the tremendous oppressive levels from law enforcement, economics, uh, the educational system, and so forth. That we're, we're the ones clawing and scraping and fighting to, to get parity, to move forward and advance ourselves in these areas. That's not required of them. Well, that, that, that is part and parcel of what leads to kind of a, 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 a separation of we're fighting for things that are not necessarily major life, death, life and death issues in the Jewish community. That's one of the reasons that I think that there has been a progressive kind of separation. Now I'm gonna say this one word right now and, and, and put it out there. Politically speaking, even the, the National American Jewish Committee, Jewish community is starting to show a little bit of, uh, of discordance relating to Israel and its role with the whole Palestinian thing and other things, okay? So, you know, when I look at that, what's happening is I think in the national uh, American Jewish community, there are certain kind of, um, what do you call it? Uh, litmus tests. Israel is a litmus test. Are you for Israel or against Israel? 
If you got a problem with Israel, now there, there's an open declaration, you're anti-Semitic. And I'm like, so I can't criticize a government? I can't criticize maybe some of the particular behaviors of the Israeli government without being anti-Semitic? That's like saying I can't criticize the, the national American government without being, I'm a racist against white people since most of the government is white. Well, if I got problems with the government, I must be racist. Now, that's the kind of thing that I think there's, is, is kind of, there's too much of that now. And we need to kind of pull back from that, you know, and stop making that a litmus test. African-Americans do not make other people, other ethnic groups uh, justify somebody in their particular ethnic group that may have done or said something racist about that. I think in, in too many cases, I'm seeing American uh, Jewish people say, well, we don't like, you know, so-and-so. And if you're telling us you're okay with so-and-so, then you must be anti-Semitic. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. We don't do that. Okay, hey, so hey. there's got to be a, a, a greater understanding of, what really constitutes something that is against your interests? I don't care whether it's Jewish, Asian, Latino, and so forth. Again, to just close this comment with, in politics, there's no such thing as platonic love, okay? So if we're going to work together, you have a different ethnic community than mine, and we're going to work together, we need to be real with each other, and we need to not let certain issues divide us that they don't necessarily have to divide us. Black people, we don't do that. We don't say, stop talking to your, your brother or your family member or somebody in your neighborhood because they said something racist. We might call you a racist, but I'm not going to extend that to all of your people. And I think there's a little bit too much of that going on in terms of Jewish and African-American relationships currently. So I, I want to give some voice to uh, some comments in the chat. So I'm going to read a question from Cynthia Ruby, I believe is her name. And then I want uh, Weichel after that to, to chime in. Cynthia's question is referring to your chapter six about uh, the idea of the black boogeyman. And she yes. is asking a question if, if you believe that that idea is a global one. And if so, kind of what the implications would be for African-Americans if, if that is indeed a sort of global idea. Well, uh, Cynthia, wherever you are, that is a great question. I have progressively been very disappointed in um, immigrants come to America from all over the world. And, and, and from my standpoint, I don't think it takes them very long, many of them, I don't care if you come from Pakistan, uh, South America, and, and I will even include African, African immigrants. I will even include black people who are coming to America, immigrating to America. There seems to be this attitude that the African American people and African American men in particular are just losers they, and lazy. And, and what I see and hear from these various ethnic groups that, that have immigrated to America, and even if they're, they're a second generation and so forth, they have picked up a lot of the same kinds of uh, imagery and uh, issues uh, for African-American people that, that whites have been saying for hundreds of years. And, and it's, it's disheartening. Uh, it makes me uh, distrustful. Uh, you know, the idea that, well, I'm Black, you're Asian, I'm Black, you're Native American, I'm Black, you're Latino, and so forth. We should have some common ground because we've all more or less suffered at the hands of white supremacy, you know, over the centuries in the United States of America. We're not building those bridges because a lot of them really hold a lot of this imagery. And, you know, as we like to say, you know, and kind of sort of think they're better than Black people, than African Americans, and I think that's worldwide. They love our entertainment. They love all of that stuff. That's not. I'm not saying you know we don't have box office stars all around the world, but you know that's fluff. That's not dealing with the reality. It's not dealing with the reality of what's happening in America to African Americans at all. 
You know, I was going to raise a point here, if I can, Walter. Uh, and I see that uh, Bob Wolfson is on the set, and I wanted to kind of say something. Years ago, we were at a meeting where they had some of the hate crimes or they had the folks who were the white supremacists putting leaflets on cars and so on in the parking lot. And uh, I remember this particular meeting at the TAC building where an uh, African-American woman stood up and says, well, how can we convince them who are these white supremacists to be better? And Bob jumped up and says, I will not support and engage people who call for my elimination as a group or as a race. And I noticed in his chat, he raises a point that I think bears understanding that people don't always understand is, it's one thing to criticize the government of Israel, but it's another thing he said in his chat or in his comment to when you say you want to get rid of the, the, the nation of Israel or the, or the country yeah. or so that nation. So again, yeah. we can be uh, cousins where we criticize each other and so yeah. on. But when someone comes at you, like many of these white supremacists who work in police departments, yeah. law enforcement, FBI, and we know that they're there because years ago in uh, the state patrol, they found a Nazi, uh, not a Nazi, but a Klan member, and they had to get him out. Uh, but I think there are a lot of sympathizers like that. So one of the things I want to just throw out is that, again, is one thing we have no litmus test to challenge the white supremacists who are in police departments or those. No. Uh, we're going to do a show on the 30th of June. Uh, uh, what a guy named Al Adam who did something about all the killings of African Americans uh, in Nebraska, and there were a number of cases where some people should have gone to jail, prison, and again, I don't believe in the death penalty, but yeah. they should have been awful close, and they got away with it because they were police officers. So yeah. again, there's a lot of heated emotions out there and trauma, and we cannot ignore the nuances of these comments. But I think Bob raises a, a very important point, and again, I think that's what we need to be conscious. Of. But I really appreciate uh, Walter how you uh, alluded to and, and explained. Uh, how we need to be constructive in our criticism and at the same time not use the closure or the council culture uh, for those of us who are involved in the race relations and trying to build a better society. We have about maybe about, uh, I would say less than probably about 10 minutes or so before we wrap down. Are there other folks who want to say something or comment because it is not forever hold your peace? And I know there's a number of folks out there. I'm surprised you're quiet as you are because I know. Yeah, uh, I was more, well, why show I think wanted to say something. Go ahead. Hello, Brother Walter Goods. How are you hey, doing? Hey, y'all? Hey. Looking great, brother. Good to see you. Thank um, you. I mean, I'm going to say this. Um, I, I would love to have you expound, but if anybody else want to comment, fine, too. But what I want to say is that I, I, I love this book. You know I love it. <laughs> but uh, um, A lot of, you know, I hear often that white Americans will say that they don't know or understand what has happened to black people in America. Uh, but they do know about the Second Amendment and how it differs America from the rest of the world. Uh, but white folks also know that blacks are citizens of this country. Yeah. And um, however, they don't think that we should exercise our constitutional rights. So no. on page 210, you spoke of uh, uh, Robert Williams, who was president of the Monroe chapter. Robert F. Williams, Monroe yes. TV, and yeah. how he created a community militia. But yeah. once he cr created this community militia uh, in defense of the Ku Klux Klan, Williams was uh, terminated as president of the Monroe chapter. Uh, and the unit's char charter was revoked and the membership ordered to disband. Yes. But what's really interesting, and I love uh, most about this uh, discussion, is it says, Robert F. Williams' outcome proved that a great many of the people who supported civil rights for Blacks rejected African Americans actually defending themselves by force of arms. As long as I was walking, just merely talking, Williams said, I had a lot of uh, white liberal support. But when I actually started arming people and picking up guns, they said I had gone too far. So when the, somebody was speaking of progression, you know, that's, that's, I mean, do anybody ever want to see us progress to the point where this is real? If I take it, you take advantage of the second amendment, you love it. I love it too. And if I have to defend myself, like you defend yourself in the name of your people, your property, why can't they understand that we have to get to that point where there's nothing wrong with us black people doing the exact same thing to defend ourselves from this onslaught that it looks like no one's going to stop from coming. Yes. You know, watch all uh, on January 6th last year, 10,000 white men attacked the capital of the United States of America. And they ran all over it. They did everything but burn it down. Exactly. And they attacked police. And I'm sitting, I watched it for hours. And I watched it on Fox News. I watched it on CNN. I watched it on everything. And I kept, I kept going, when are the police going to draw their weapons and start shooting? Because throughout hours of viewing this, I kept going, African-Americans, we are killed instantly for nothing. 
Right. Nothing, no weapons, didn't put our hands, didn't touch the cop. And here are all these white men hitting them with iron bars, spraying them with bear spray and blinding them and everything. And, and to a, the African-American community, everybody I've talked to, we're, we're all like, did you see this? Right. They were, they were directly, and, and the cops wouldn't shoot them. And it's not like I wanted some kind of a massacre, but it's like, how do you justify Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and all of these killings one after another over and over and over again of unarmed, innocent Black people? They and yet here you are, and it happened again in Uvalde a couple of weeks ago, you have a dozen, 15 armed, heavily armed law enforcement officers, and they didn't go in there to get that killer until after he had slaughtered a classroom full of babies again. And it's like, how do you kill us at the drop of a hat? And yeah. then here's the one moment, truly, you have the, 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 the actual demand go in there and put somebody down and stop this massacre and they all got excuses. Robert F. Williams defended black people. I bring him up three times in my book. He wasn't the only one that created uh, self-defense groups against racism, but his case was so egregious because the NAACP, he was the chapter president and they excommunicated him because they felt that the preservation of their public image as a nonviolent organization was more important than that this man, a Marine Corps Korean War veteran, had organized people in the community to arm themselves and stop the Ku Klux Klan from doing violence to Black people in Monroe, North Carolina. And I'm just like, that's insane. We started this conversation out, and I'll, I'll make this, we started this conversation out talking about, you know, the whole perspective of, of what's happened to Black people. And America has become an extremely dangerous place for African Americans, particularly because we can no longer rely upon the one law enforcement entity administration to consider our lives as valuable as, as white lives or anybody else's lives. We're not dealing with the Ku Klux Klan anymore. We're dealing with uniformed, authorized, trained and armed police. So to, to stand, up against the, stand up against the racist killers now means we have to, we are literally having to go against the entire government because they're the first line of defense for all the government that is above them. So it's a very hard thing for us to look at. And that's one of the reasons we're at this impasse. How do you stop the police from killing us? That's a $300 billion question. How do we do that? Right. We don't wanna to go to war. That's, I repeat multiple times in my book, I don't want race war in America. I don't want the African-American people to have to deal with an armed confrontation with this nation's government because I'm a Vietnam veteran. I know what, what's going to happen next. I'm not saying we're going to get wiped off the face of the earth, but I know America will never be the same if it gets to that level. So all of us, white, black, and otherwise, we've got to figure out a way to avoid this, to, to dial this back. And I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing more arms. And there's a huge arms race that's mostly in the white community. We, we're, we're, Walter, we've got like 10 minutes left. And I want to give Paul has his hand. It's probably the last question. Yes. I'm going to give you a chance for closure. So, okay. Paul, if you could raise your question or comment, and then uh, Walter would ask you to give some summation, and then we'll do the evaluation and so on. So, right. Paul. Thanks, Walter. Yes, Wyshaw, thank you. Hey, Walter. Um, I wanted to just thank you. I've been uh, spending time with my 96-year-old World War II veteran dad. There you go. Uh, he, he needs a little bit of support. But interestingly enough, I've been learning a lot about his life, and he's been reading a lot. Um, he was, his father was Jewish, fought in World War I, and in the 30s, 
Um, his father lost his company. They took it away from him. And then he was able to take my dad and leave Germany just before um, the ships got turned back. And then I think his aunt did die in the Holocaust. Um, and I've been learning a lot from that. And, and so that's what caught my attention when you wrote this book. And I've been connecting it more and more because I got a copy of Raul's book that you were just talking about, that big volume about the genocide. Yes. And what what's this is what I, struck me the most about your your book. And and having listened and read all this stuff about genocide with my with the the um, the Jewish population, and then listening to you talk about it, and then like today, I was just reading in the paper they're digging up twelve hundred bodies in um, Ukraine. Sure. It's it's this human nature of doing this genocide thing over and over. And what is in our human nature that keeps allowing this to happen? And, and I, I think you're the black population in the United States, like mass incarceration, the poverty, the all that stuff just fits right into yeah. how we get detached and can commit genocide. But I don't know if you can just talk about the genocide concept because you, you really hit that hard. And, and I really appreciate you doing that. The toughest thing for me now talking to people um, is the mass killing, you know, that we associate with the Holocaust. It isn't happening yet. But I believe I have made a credible case to say if the trajectory of America regarding white supremacy and racism is not inter, uh, interdicted, uh, you know, and dialed back, I don't see any other outcome possible because we are not going to be a people who will suffer mass murder. So if, if it's coming to that, it, it, it's going it's to destroy all of America. It'll be a fight to the death. We don't want that. But that may not be our call. We'll respond, but that's not, that's not what we want. We would like some kind of dialing back and let's look at what we really need to be as a nation state uh, that has some degree of equity and parity and fairness for all of its citizens. Well, you know, we're, we're, get, we're, we're within our time zone here. There's two questions I might want to ask. And I think yeah, uh, well, I, I wanted to, uh, Beth, uh, Beth for long, do you have a question? I saw yeah. that that came through the chat. Beth? Okay. Oh, okay. I guess I was wrong. Sorry. And then was there one other question before we close out? And again, I want everybody within the sound of my voice to know I'm more than happy to continue uh, any of the questions that you may have asked or, or it may pop into your mind while you're reading the book or on anything else. This is how I learned. Uh, the, the great Senator Ernie Chambers of Omaha, Nebraska, uh, his favorite expression was iron sharpens iron. And I've always repeated that because I believe that. I learned from you. you. You've all read my book or are in the process of reading it or may go out and get it if you haven't gotten it. And I appreciate that. But the bottom line is this. I'm, I'm here to learn too. I've written a book. I'm not saying my book is all the answers. I, and, and I hate it when people, you know, they, you know, they look at you, well, well, what is your answer? Well, I, you know, like I'm supposed to have one person, one mind, Walter Vincent Brooks, I'm supposed to have some kind of big plan for how to save America. I don't. Not one person. That's got to be all of us. And so I'm, I just want you to know, I, if you send me an email, you know, wanting to talk about something, I, I love it. I love it. And it also helps me really formulate, uh, you know, what I'm saying. And, 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 you know, maybe I'll realize, well, you know, next time I have a chance to speak publicly on and, and relating to your particular interest, uh, I think I'll have a better way to explain myself because I've had this conversation, even if it's email, I've had this conversation with you. So I want all of you to understand that. I, I, I want to hear from you. Not sure. just because you read the book. Uh, it's, it's a great point, Walter. I mean, these are uh, the, these are questions that if they had simple answers, there wouldn't be a book, and we wouldn't be yeah. having a Zoom call about it. Um, yeah. And uh, but what you what you've laid out is is very eloquent, very impressive, and um, I think we're we're going to start rolling out the uh, 
surveys for people now. Um, and just to, in, in the interest of time, there it is, the evaluation form. Um, Walter, is there anything that, that you would like to share that you don't think we've touched on or that is just floating in your mind based on kind of where our conversation has gone tonight? Uh, no, no, no. I, this, this has been brilliant. I'm very grateful. Um, well, trying to hear what you said, said. Did you use the word brilliant? Did you say brilliant? I like to hear that word more often. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I specifically wasn't referring to Ajamal Binding, but um, the rest of you, yes, you're all brilliant. No, um, and, and the thing for me is this is 46 years in the making, and tonight, more than ever, I feel justified. I feel justified in what I wrote. I feel justified in the approach that I took. And I'm so grateful for the hundreds of books that I read and all the very, I wish, you know, I got 456 citations. I, I put a lot of work into this, but tonight I am absolutely without a doubt, I wrote the right book for our time. And I don't think any author can ask for more than that. And I know this is just, you know, 30 or 40 people listening in, but this is, this is all I needed. You've verified, you've justified me. I will go forward, um, you know, with more public contact. And that's why, again, I'm going to say one more time, if you send me an email and want to, want to talk about something, I will respond. I'll look forward to it. In fact, it'll mean a lot to me because, yeah, we've all got to figure out together how to make this thing work because America is coming apart at the seams while we speak. And it's like, wow, how are we going to get out of this with the emphasis on WE? How are we going to get out of where America is right now and where it's really, I think my book is saying, where it's looking like it's going to go if we don't get something done and, and turn course? And I believe we can do that. That's my positivity. I believe we can. I also feel positively, if it goes the worst case scenario, the African-American people, we've been kept alive for 400 years. And if it's to bring the temple down, well, then that's what will have to happen. We don't want that. But there's a lot of armed, dangerous people who are thirsting for our blood now. And the Jewish community knows what that feels like. They felt that burn to the utmost and they will be feeling it for a thousand years to lose that many people so horrendously. I don't want the African-American people to be next because if we're next then there'll be somebody after us too. It's a process that is workable and can take millions of people and, and wipe them off with, with you know, I won't say very easily, but it's, the Holocaust has proven it can be done. And if it could be done once, just like dropping the atomic bomb on Japan, then, not, then there can be another Holocaust. No, it won't be the exact way it happened under Nazi Germany, but another one can come because as Dr. Raul Hilberg showed me through his teachings, it is a scientifically evolved process that with certain modifications can be applied pretty much in any country on the face of this earth now. Well, We've been well, fighting the atomic bomb for 75 years. There's never been another one dropped. There's been a number of mass exterminations, even including what's going on in Ukraine. Well, Walter, we're, we're gonna have to close down. Uh, we're getting close That's to the fine. very end. We're okay. gonna, and really, really appreciate you, Walter Vincent Brooks, for doing this tonight and Thank again, you. providing Thank insight. All of you. Thank you so much. our audience in a robust, robust, robust conversation. Also, Nick, I uh, really appreciate you co-hosting here with me and, of course, advancing the concept of bringing Walter uh, to our community in this format, and hopefully there will be other opportunities. I want to make two quick shameless plugs before we get off. Number one, we'd like folks to visit our website. We are telling, selling T-shirts. There's uh, more T-shirts, anti-racism. We'd love people to buy those. We're basically producing them and selling them almost at cost because we want people to push anti-racism more of agenda. And then the second thing 
I alluded to earlier, we're going to have Adam Fletcher, who was a, a, a longtime resident of North Omaha, but he lives in Spokane, Washington, or in Olympic, Washington. And he wrote about a number of North Omaha incidents and situations, and he's a, considered a great historian of North Omaha. And so we're going to invite him on on the 30th of uh, June at 7 o'clock to talk about uh, the killings of African Americans and murders. Some of them were actually just murdered. Uh, and again, uh, this course of that, of how that all evolved and so on. And then maybe even talk about some other things practices he's working on. So we look forward to you joining us in the future. And we really appreciate you being here tonight. And as we always end, may the force be with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, all of you. May I make one last comment if we got 30 seconds? My yeah. book is available online at the Afro-American Bookstore in North Omaha. Uh, you can go to my website that I mentioned and get a direct link, or you can uh, go to the Afro-American Bookstore yourself. If for any reason you try to purchase a book and there's any glitch or anything, then what I want you to do is contact me on my email and I will arrange to send you a copy of my book personally. And then you can pay me after you get it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for being here. Morocco.